Those who tend to look to that model are unlikely to think that a federal court back in 1896 should have declared legally mandated racial segregation unconstitutional. But if Plessy was not wrong, how is it that Brown came out so differently? The language of the Constitution's guarantee of equal protection of the laws did not change between 1896 and 1954. And it would be very hard to say that the obvious facts on which Plessy was based had changed. While Plessy was about railroad cars and Brown was about schools and schoolrooms, that distinction was no great difference. And actually, the best clue to the difference between the cases is the dates they were decided, which I think lead to the explanation for their divergent results. As I have said elsewhere, the members of the court in the Plessy case remembered the day when human slavery was the law in much of the land. To that generation, the formal equality of an identical railroad car meant enormous progress. But the generation in power in 1954 looked at enforced separation without the revolting background of slavery to make it look unexceptional by contrast. As a consequence, the judges in 1954 found a meaning in segregation that the majority of their predecessors in 1896 simply did not see. That meaning is not captured by descriptions of physically identical schools or physical, physically identical railroad cars. The meaning of facts arises elsewhere and its judicial perception turns on the experience of the judges and on their ability to think from a point of view that is different from their own. Meaning comes from the capacity to see what is not in some simple objective sense there on a printed page. And when the judges of 1954 read the record of enforced segregation, it carried only one possible meaning to them. It expressed a judgment of inherent inferiority on the part of the minority race. And the judges who understood the meaning that was apparent in 1954 would have violated their oaths to uphold the Constitution if they had not held the segregation mandate unconstitutional. Again, a rhetorical question. Did the judges of 1954 cross some limit of legitimacy into lawmaking by stating a constitution, that, a conclusion that you will not find written in the Constitution? Was it activism to act based on the current meaning of facts that at a purely objective level were about the same as Plessy's facts 60 years before? Again, of course, you know my answer. And so much for the assumption that facts just lie there waiting for an objective judge to view them. So let me, like the, like the lawyer I am, sum up the case I've tried to present this afternoon. The fair reading model fails to account for what the Constitution actually says and it fails just as badly to understand what judges have no choice but to do. The Constitution is a pantheon of values and a lot of hard cases are hard because the Constitution gives no simple rule of decision for the cases in which one of the values is truly at odds with another. Not even its most uncompromising and unconditional language can resolve every potential tension of one provision with another provision, a tension that the Constitution's framers left to be resolved another day. And another day after that, for our cases can give no answers that fit all conflicts and, and no resolutions that are immune to rethinking when the significance of old facts have changed with the changing world. And these are reasons enough to show how egregiously it misses the point to think of judges in constitutional cases as just sitting there reading constitutional phrases fairly and looking at reported facts objectively to produce their judgments. 
judges have to choose between the good things that the Constitution approves, and when they do, they have to choose not on the basis of measurements, but of meanings. The fair reading model misses that, but it misses even more. Remember that the tensions that are the stuff of judging in so many hard constitutional cases are, after all, creatures of our aspirations. Aspirations to liberty as well as to order, and to fairness and equality as well as to liberty. And the very opportunity for conflict between one high value and another reflects our confidence that a way may be found to resolve it when a conflict arises. That is why the simplistic view of the Constitution devalues our aspirations, and it attacks our confidence, and it diminishes us. It is a view of judging that means to discourage our tenacity, including our sometimes reluctant tenacity to keep the constitutional promises the nation has been made. So it is tempting. It is tempting to dismiss the critical record of rhetoric of lawmaking and activism as simply a rejection of too many of the hopes we profess to share as the American people. But there is one thing more. I have to believe that something deeper is involved and that behind most of the dreams of a simpler constitution there lies a basic human hunger for the certainty and control that the fair reading model seems to promise. And who has not felt that same hunger? Is there any one of us who has not lived through moments and perhaps years of longing for a world without any ambiguity? For the stability of something unchangeable in human institutions? I don't forget my own longing, a longing for certainty that resisted the pronouncement of Justice Holmes, which I read as an undergraduate, that certainty generally is illusion and repose is not our destiny. But I have come to understand that he was right. And by the same token, I understand that I differ from the critics I've described, not merely in seeing the patent wisdom of Brown or in espousing the rule excluding unlawfully seized evidence or in understanding the scope of habeas corpus. Where I suspect we differ most fundamentally is in my belief that in an indeterminate world I cannot control, it is still possible to live fully in the trust that a way will be found leading through the future, uncertain as it is. And to me, the future of the Constitution as the framers wrote it can be staked only upon that same trust. If we cannot share every intellectual assumption that formed the minds of those who framed the Charter, we can still address the constitutional uncertainties the way they must have envisioned, by relying on reason, by respecting all the words the framers wrote, by facing facts, and by seeking to understand the meaning of those facts for living people. That is how a judge lives in a state of trust, and I know of no other way to make good on the aspirations that tell us who we are and who we mean to be as the people of the United States. <laughs>